I'm Nate Mortimer. Um, I am the, the project leader for the WASP project. Um, and so what I wanted to do today was tell you a little bit about um, my scientific interest in this project, um, some of the background, and then talk about two projects that GEP students are contributing to. Um, one of them is a project that's almost finished and one is, is one that's just getting started. Uh, okay, so the first we'll start out with, with just the system. Um, so what we study in my lab are parasitoid wasps that infect uh, species of Drosophila. Um, so these wasps are obligate parasitoids of Drosophila. Um, and when they infect, they actually transfer their egg and venom proteins into the body cavity of a fly larva. Um, and then it starts sort of the host parasite interaction. Um, and in the lab, what we're interested in is sort of generally understanding these host parasite interactions um, but also looking more specifically at these venom proteins and trying to understand the evolution and, and the function of these coding sequences. Um, and of course, gene annotation is really helpful for both of these areas of research. Um, and so speaking of gene annotation, uh, we'll take a quick look at the wasp genome browser. Um, so we have three parasitoid wasp um, species that have been sequenced. Um, and from each of those, we have the genome sequence, we have RNA-seq from adult wasps, um, and we also have proteomics data of purified venom. Um, and so from these proteomics data, we've identified about 150 venom proteins in each species. Um, and within the browser, each of the peptides that we found in the proteomics screen is mapped onto the browser. And so it's very easy to look at a protein and see, or look at a gene and see if the protein that it codes is found in venom. Um, and we are right now halfway through collecting the samples to sequence two additional wasp species. Um, they both have interesting function and they fall in kind of an interesting evolutionary relationship to the species we already have. Um, and I will point out that the, the gene models that we have um, from our transcriptome assembly and also from the um, automated predictors are really, really bad. Um, for the wasps. So there's a, a great need for um, manual annotation still. Um, our reference genome is quite diverged from the species we're working on. Um, it would be like trying to, the equivalent of trying to annotate mosquito genes using Drosophila as your reference genome. So there's, there's quite a bit of evolutionary distance there. Um, and so we'll, we'll get into a couple of, of uh, projects to talk about quickly. Um, so when we think about host parasite relationships, um, this is a relationship where the parasite is essentially exploiting its host to get um, fitness advantage. Um, and in our case, we have a wasp that develops inside the host. Um, and while it's developing, it's going to use the fly's resources um, in order to get through its development milestones. And then eventually it's gonna kill it and eat its host. Um, parasites in general in this adaptation to a parasitic lifestyle um, have very altered biosynthetic pathways and metabolic pathways. Um, and so we're interested in looking in these wasp genomes and see if we can see any evidence for uh, genomic adaptations to a parasitic lifestyle. Um, and so what we started out with is looking at lipid synthesis. Um, and so there was a paper published about 10 years ago now um, where they looked at 30 or 40 different parasitoid species um, and measured their ability to synthesize lipids as adults. Um, and most of the species as that have had actually lost the ability to do that, um, but they didn't know why or how that ability was lost. Um, the hypothesis put forward was that the genes necessary for lipid synthesis would be missing, right? So they would be deleted or they might have turned into pseudogenes over time. Um, and we actually have a really nice system to study this um, because two of our species are very closely related um, and one of them can still do lipid synthesis, which is heterotoma, and the other species, Bilardi, cannot. Um, the third species we study is its lipid synthesis is unknown, so we think we can use it as a way of, of seeing the predictive power of our genomics. Um, and so to try to understand this process, what we did is to um, identify all the genes involved in triglyceride synthesis in Drosophila. Um, so this is a pathway that's pretty well worked out. Um, and so we were able to take these genes and then identify those which are also conserved in hymenopterans, um, which all of our wasp species are, are hymenopterans. Um, and we found 14 genes in total. 
Um, and these are split between working in fatty acid synthesis and then the assembly of triglycerides. Um, and our goal was to try to annotate all 14 genes from each of our parasitoid species. Um, before I get to the results, I just wanted to thank all of the faculty he listed here whose students um, contributed to this project. Um, and in particular, Melanie and Rivka, who participated a couple of years in this project, and I think have been involved every year since and have given me really good feedback. Um, so I really appreciate both of you and, and everything you've done for this project. Um, thinking about the results. So surprisingly, we were able to find all 14 genes in the genomes of each species. Um, one of the genes called bad egg um, is pretty diverged from melanogaster, so it was a little tougher to find. Um, but that was the same of all of, in all of the parasitoids, so it wouldn't be um, necessarily explaining the difference between them. Um, and then we also found from sort of a preliminary look that each of these genes encodes a complete open reading frame and that the protein would have its, its predicted function. Um, so there's no, doesn't appear to be any loss of genes or, or, or pseudo genes appearing. Um, but what the students did notice that was very exciting is um, for one of the genes involved in fatty acid synthesis, we have no RNA-seq data in two of the species. Um, and that happens to be Bilardi, which is the species that doesn't do lipid synthesis. Whereas in heterotoma, the one that can, um, this gene is expressed pretty highly. Um, and so we have a new hypothesis now that's actually differential expression of the genes that's underlying this loss of the trait. Um, and sort of the further idea that students came up with is that maybe it's a developmental thing. Right, so maybe during development, when the fly or the wasp is consuming the fly, um, it has an active lipid synthesis pathway, and then it gets shut off in the adult stage when they're not really eating. Um, and so we're in the process of testing that in the lab right now. Um, and I'm also going to have a little shout for collaborators here. Um, anyone who's interested in kind of looking at these pathways, and, and particularly if you can measure lipid synthesis, um, if that's something you do with your students in the lab, and you'd like to be part of the project, please let me know. Um, we would like to see what happens with our, our species of what we don't know um, the outcome yet um, to see how predictive our, our results would be. Um, so let me know if you're, if you're interested in that. All right, so we'll switch up just a little bit and talk about kind of the main focus, which is this research in um, venom evolution and venom function. Um, and so I'm really interested in these venom proteins because they are able to manipulate um, conserve signaling pathways in their host. Um, they do things like block immune signaling. Um, they can actually alter the host metabolism and development. Um, and what's really exciting is that we found um, several wasp species whose venoms actually change the phenotype of fly models of human disease. Um, so we've been looking at models of leukemia, models of epithelial cancer, and we're actually finding venoms that seem to block the, um, the oncogenic steps. Um, and so we're very interested in, in kind of understanding the protein, co protein content better um, and being able to figure out how, how these venoms are, are interacting with the host pathways. Um, like I said, we found about 150 venom proteins in each wasp species. Um, and looking through them, we identified about 30 gene families that are found in the venoms of all three of the species. Um, so kind of our current focus in the project is to annotate all of the venom and the non-venom um, versions of these genes and these gene families um, in order to look at some of the evolution and make some predictions about function. Um, and so what I wanted to do next is just take a couple of minutes um, and tell you about the first of these that we've worked on. Um, and this is a gene family um, called neprilysin. So neprilysins are uh, proteases and they're known to regulate multiple signaling pathways um, by targeting small peptides for degradation. Um, and what's really interesting is all of the wasps have um, multiple neprilysins, um, ranging from three up to 13, so quite a bit of uh, difference in gene content. Um, and they all have at least one that's found in their venom. Um, and so we were you know, very interested in this finding that you know, a, a protease known to regulate multiple signaling peptides is found in wasp venom, sounds like a, a good starting point. Um, and so we wanted to have a look at those. Um, and so this project has only just started. Um, so I had students in my class this year do annotations um, of a bunch of these genes. We haven't done all of them yet, but a bunch of these genes. 
Um, and then I always have my students do sort of additional projects. Um, and so I had a couple of them build um, a phylogenetic tree of the sequences of the genes that we had um, annotated. Um, and that's what you're seeing here. Um, so the first question we wanted to ask was, was um, to look at this sort of expansion of the gene family and see what may be going on. Um, and so if we color code the tree by species, um, we can see that kind of each clade is a discrete species um, with a couple of species represented a couple of times on here. Um, so this kind of suggests to us that um, this, this gene expansion is occurring sort of independently within wasp species, um, which, is, which is interesting. And, and obviously we need to resolve it a little better, um, but it's kind of a, a cool finding. Um, and then of course the venoms are, are the main interest. Um, and so we wanted to see whether the, the venom versions of nephrolysin were more closely related to each other or whether they were the result of independent um, recruitment of nephrolysin into venom. Um, and having a look, if we highlight um, all of the, the venom nephrolysins, um, we can see they're kind of distributed throughout the tree, um, which supports an idea that this is a gene that's been recruited into parasitoid venom um, multiple independent times. Um, of course, we can't rule out that um, these are just quickly diverging genes, but um, it's definitely something to, to look at more, but, but suggestive that we probably have multiple events leading to, to what we see in the venom. Um, and then I also like my students to try to take the genes they've annotated um, and look at the proteins and, and make functional um, predictions about those proteins. Um, and so I had them do this. Um, and so the first finding that was kind of cool is we found uh, several nephrolysins that were missing the active site. Um, so we would predict that these might be catalytically inactive versions of nephrolysin. Um, and this is not unheard of. So in Drosophila, they actually, Drosophila and Melanogaster actually have 21 um, duplicated nephrolysin-like genes that have no catalytic site. Um, and so this, this seems to be something too, having um, inactive nephrolysin is, is in some way advantageous to an organism. Um, but what I was more excited about is we actually found several genes that students predict would have altered um, enzyme specificity. And so these are proteins where there is um, decreased homology in the substrate interaction domains and in some of the other functional parts of the protein. Um, but they still maintain the active site and the zinc binding site. Um, so they would probably have some activity, just that you know, we would predict that it may be um, slightly altered from, from what we expect um, based on the, the cellular versions of these proteins. Um, and then of course we have to see which ones were the venom. So if we overlay the venom sequences back on, um, we can actually see that a lot of these proteins that are predicted to have an altered specificity are found in the venoms. Um, and that's, of course, something that I'm very interested in um, thinking about the evolution of venom proteins relative to the, the non-venom um, cellular versions of those proteins. And so to kind of quickly wrap up um, this little project, um, we found that um, a lot of these venom nephrolysins are predicted to have some kind of altered specificity or activity. Um, and of course, this is very preliminary. So we haven't annotated all of the NEP genes yet. Um, and so far, only students in my class have done this. So we only have a single model for each of these. Um, and so it'd be really exciting to get um, you know, more of these annotated so that we can actually come up with better gene models and, and do sort of a final phylogenetic analysis of them. Um, and then what I wanna do with, with my class this coming spring um, is to actually express a bunch of these nephrolysins. So the venoms, some of the non-venoms, um, and then you know, the ones that are predicted to be active versus inactive and test their activity. Um, so we're kind of still designing some how to test the activity, but um, it seems as though there are several reagents available. Um, and so this is something that, that we should be able to do. Um, and so hopefully I'll have something next year that I can tell you a little bit about how that went. Um, and so that's kind of all I wanted to talk about today. Um, we'll have you know, plenty of time for questions here. Um, I do wanna point out that um, all of the information for this project um, is available on the Trello board. Um, it made my font huge here, but it's good. So join the board if you wanna find out more. Um, anytime I have an announcement about 
um, the project, I'm going to send it out through the Trello board. It's generally only two or three times a year, so it's not uh, it's not spam or anything like that. Um, and that's where I post sort of all the slides. So these slides are already posted there, and and all the material. Um, you know, I have a, a couple of grants where to look at venoms, and so I have some of the material from the grants posted there, um, and also papers that that we've published on the topic. Um, so there's a lot of background stuff there. Um, if you want to get into it. Um, that's also where you'll find information about um, the gene claim form. Um, and then, of course, there is a, a project site on the website um, that has links to all of the WASP-specific annotation tools and the WASP browsers. Um, if you have any questions about, you know, the project in general, um, how to get into, uh, you know, how to get involved, how, you know, how to think about and um, ways of implementing, um, just get in touch with me, you know, either throughout this time or, or by email. Um, I'm always happy to, to sit and talk about it. Um, you know, I've also sort of virtually visited a bunch of classrooms and in person visited a couple of classrooms. Um, so if you're interested in the project and kind of want, um, you know, to have me come and talk to your students, I'm, I'm always happy to do that. Um, I've probably done that, you know, five or 10 times so far, and it's, and it's always a lot of fun to meet new students. Um, and then the last point is um, there's going to be a working group on Sunday um, looking at or thinking about um, ways that we might be able to develop some wet lab tie-ins to, to the project. Um, and so if that's something you're interested in um, and you can make it, hopefully I'll see you on Sunday. Um, but if not, you know, look for our, our reporting back and, and ways to get involved over the next couple of years on, on working on that. Um, and of course, finally, I, I won't need to thank people. Um, so really all of GEP, um, and in particular, the, the faculty who have been my collaborators on this project and, and the students who have done all the work. Um, within the GEP, obviously, I'd like to thank the Science and IT Committee for, for a lot of really good feedback on the project. Um, Marisol, I think this project, this picture has been used several times this week, um, but Marisol has really been the driving force in putting together a, uh, a whole new curriculum um, for students to do um, WASP annotation projects, um, and that should be available for everyone for the next fall semester. Um, and then Vida, Jacob, and Rachel, um, from a more selfish perspective, I'd like to thank them for, for sending their awesome students to me. Um, so I've had a couple of GEP alumni um, in my lab as grad students um, and another one starting this fall. Um, and so that's been a lot of fun. Um, I should also acknowledge that the genome sequence um, we got from Todd Schlenke. And I've had a couple of students in my lab that have done an awful lot to help this project get going. Um, and then funding um, from, from the NIH. And it looks like I've got a couple of minutes left if anyone has questions. Um, but if not, we'll have the breakout session after and, and you know, I'm kind of generally around. So if you have any questions about anything, please just let me know.